probably not keep them waiting any longer. So hi, everyone. And also good afternoon to those joining from IGF in Kyoto. Uh, though it would have been nice for all of us to hold this session in person um, in, in Kyoto, of course. I must admit, I really do appreciate the access that this hybrid um, form of event provides, looking especially at this fantastic group of speakers that we are able to have with us today. So thank you all for joining. My name is Denise Wagner, and I have the privilege of moderating this discussion for the next hour, where I, can, I want us to imagine a little bit the future of the media. What will it look like 10 years from now? And who will be the main actors shaping that information space? And what purpose will they serve in our societies? Admittedly, we're having this conversation in a time of major uncertainty. Many political developments around the world are deeply worrying. Conflicts and wars escalating with devastating impact on human lives and little hope for peaceful solutions in near sight. Democracy is eroding as we have heard time and time again and private actors are continuing to exploit and capitalize on the newest technologies, always staying one step ahead of regulation at the expense of our digital rights. So how can we define what comes after the uncertainty? How can we shape or influence the way emerging technologies are developed and deployed? And how can we ensure that the media of tomorrow serves as this beacon of truth, democracy, peace, and security? I'm joined by a fantastic panel to start off our discussion around these somewhat difficult questions. <laughs> um, and let me quickly introduce them all. So first we have Teresa Ribeiro, who is the OSCE representative on freedom of the media. Mira Selva, the CEO of Internews Europe. Khadija Patel is the chairperson of the IPI board and head of programs of the International Fund for Public Interest Media. And Susie Allegri, a senior fellow at the Center for International Governance Innovation, director of Allegri International and author of Freedom to Think. A must read book, by the way, about how the online information ecosystem undermines our independence of opinion. So I wanna start by doing one round of quick questions to all of you, and then would invite our participants if they have any questions or comments to pose those. And after that, I'd like to pose a second round of questions to our speakers as well. So let's dive right in and start with a question for Teresa. How can we ensure that the media can serve the public interest? How can we make sure it is able to play its crucial role for democracy and security now, but also in the future? Teresa, over you. Thank you, Denise. And it's really a pleasure to, to be here with such uh, uh, high level panelists and uh, uh, that are also uh, good friends of, uh, of, uh, of the Office of the Representative on Freedom of the Media. Um, so it's, it's really, and after, uh, you know, uh, everything that you just said, uh, Denise, and all these key questions, uh, I would like to start by saying that, that uh, I think one of the biggest challenges democracy um, will face and is facing already uh, is definitely uh, artificial intelligence and uh, the disruptive uh, and the disruptions uh, in the digital space. And if you will not be able, if you fail this challenge, um, definitely uh, we will pay a high price uh, as democratic countries uh, uh, in the future. So I would say for me, this is uh, really key uh, to ensure that we are all prepared uh, to uh, to look at this uh, biggest challenge and to look at it in the right way. It means that it's not enough just to have some guardrails uh, regarding what is happening in the digital space, but on the contrary, we really need to put the technology at the service of democracy, and it's possible. And we need to use um, the technology uh, to boost democracy, to improve democracy, and not just uh, uh, to be um, a cause for uh, the destruction or at least the disruption uh, of democracy. So this is my uh, my first uh, my first uh, 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 my first concern to to tell you the truth, um, because if. Um, 
we will not be able uh, to face this challenge again. We cannot have what is basic uh, for the citizens, which is a clean information, which is uh, a proper information, uh, as we have clean water and we need clean information uh, for the citizens, uh, for them to be empowered, to be driving forces of transformation in our societies, uh, and to take informed decisions uh, and to have the sense of belonging uh, to, to their communities, to their societies, uh, for them to fully participate and to ensure democracy is alive. I do not, maybe I will, I'm extending a little bit too much. If it's the case, please let me know. But maybe uh, it will be nice also to hear the other panelists and I will gladly go back uh, again to uh, develop a little bit more or to elaborate a little bit more on this uh, on these main issues that I just uh, raised. Thank you, Teresa. No, I think we're all very happy to hear your thoughts on this, uh, but I will definitely come back to you with a, with a second uh, um, question to follow up on what you have said. Um, but based on but what you said, Mira, I'd like to turn to you next, if I may. Teresa just mentioned that, you know, AI, for example, is one of the biggest challenges for the future of democracy and how much it poses um, or how much all of this uh, poses a big challenge for the media, um, which is put it, which is in a way facing a litmus test. Um, so my question to you is uh, specifically about that and, and what the situation the media finds itself in. Is it facing an existential crisis? Um, and is it just the media that is facing this crisis or is it also democracy as Teresa has uh, touched upon? Um, is it more, uh, and what is driving this crisis? What, what's going on? There's several aspects to this. So there's the kind of financial aspect of the media industry. The technology firms have upended the business models for journalism. So traditional advertising led revenue models were take, turned on their heads over 10 years ago. The media industry struggled to adapt, struggled to work with the technology companies, found ways of working. And now we're in another era where the technology companies are push, pulling away from news. And so even the models of distribution and cooperation that existed have, are now being changed again. So there's a kind of problem over who funds the media because it's not very clear. And at the same time, we see certain governments, ad, you know, weaponizing advertising revenue. So they give they give government, government public advertising spend to media outlets that are favorable to them and with, withhold it from ones that are critical. So we're seeing that media companies are really facing different kinds of pressures. And at the same time, we're seeing an absolute breakdown of trust, not just in journalism, but in democratic institutions and in in kind of institutions in general. And this is driven by rising inequalities in societies in many cases. It's driven by increasingly polarized narratives. So we really struggle in communities to find a shared ground, to find a shared agreement, even on what is fact and what is, you know, what is the truth and what is a lie. And once you don't have that shared ground, it becomes really impossible to debate policy outcomes and debate, you know, and possible solutions because we don't even agree on, on the fundamentals. At the same time, people still need stories, people still crave stories, people still seek out information. So what media really needs to find a way of doing is providing this information for people and finding a way to be financially viable while doing that. So there is an existential crisis, but the need for journalism and the services that journalism provides is still very much there. Thank you, Mira. So financial aspects of the crisis, definitely uh, also the models of distribution have changed. So it's really a lot of layers and, and you've mentioned trust. I think we'll probably talk about that um, at length again um, with, with all of the speakers, because this is really a big uh, question, trust in the media and this blurring of lines between what is you know, truth or reality and, and what isn't is, is, is really impacting the, the trust that uh, the public has, like you say, in media, but also in institutions. Um, it's, it, it's, it's, it, it didn't just happen yesterday, right? It's a long-term issue that, that you've just spelled out. 
Um, which brings me to Khadija, who I also have a question about, you know, sort of a little bit maybe the background of this, this crisis. And um, Khadija, recently, actually, at the IPI World Congress this year, you opened with a keynote, and I had the um, wonderful honor of listening to that keynote at the event, where you spoke about a prolonged crisis of the media. And this really resonated with me and resonated, I think, with a lot of people in, in that room and probably with many people listening today. You said that for the last decade or so, we've been talking about an emerging crisis, a crisis oncoming. Um, and, uh, and, and now that this is just sort of the reality that, that we are in, those who work in the media, those who work to protect um, the role of the media, um, but we've spoken a lot about doom and gloom here. So I wanted to also mention that, that what, what, what really resonated, I think, was that you also spoke a lot about hope and resilience. And that was really wonderful to hear. And I think gave us a sort of um, moment of uh, energy again to, to work on, on the things that we are working on. But in this period of prolonged crisis, as you've mentioned, is the media still able to be effective uh, in such a crisis? Or in other words, is... is is it able to be effective and is media or independent media still able to be relevant um, for democracy, for peace and, and for human security today? Thanks, Denise. And uh, yeah, I think that it's absolutely essential. Um, we cannot conceive of ourselves. We cannot conceive of others without information about each other. And that's what independent media ultimately guarantees us. Um, it, it's essential. And um, without it, we're not able to understand the world that we're living in. We're not able to make decisions about how we will vote in elections, who indeed we trust to lead us. Um, there is a crisis, as you you know, as you've pointed out, and it's a, pro a moment of prolonged crisis. It's become the reality um, that, you know, the world of news media, the world of journalism is just not a great place to be in right now. Um, and, um, you know, it, it really it really irks me when um, I hear experienced journalists um, listening to younger people saying they want to be journalists and discouraging them from that. Because the world that I want to ensure exists is the world in which a young woman like me from Johannesburg, South Africa can grow up and say they want to be a journalist and that dream is fulfilled and it's not, um, it, it's not silly, but increasingly, there's a bit of noise coming in, I'm not sure from where, um, but increasingly what we're headed towards is a world in which news media is seen as a um, as bastion for elites um, and where you know rank and file people will never actually get into if indeed independent media even exists right so for us it's not just about understanding um, how essential news media is to democracy because it is essential um, if democracy is a system of governance that assures every person their ability to have a say in how they are governed, then the media is essential to facilitating that, to holding that system even accountable. And what we are headed toward is a world in which all of these things are deeply endangered. And it's a moment of crisis, but I think there's also a great moment of opportunity. Um, and there is so much to mourn for the work that we've done that, you know, hasn't gone far. Um, you know, Denise, you mentioned, you know, even the distribution on social media, uh, you know, breaking down as, you know, in, in the early parts of my career as, a, you know, a, a digital native journalist, that was the only way we knew how to do journalism, right? We, we wrote, we published stories, we plucked them um, on the social media platforms, and that's how we got an audience. And, you know, even all of that has been upended. Um, so I think that there's also a crucial moment of opportunity for us to, first of all, recalibrate um, the relationships between news media 
and uh, the platforms, but also news media and democratic institutions, uh, the platforms and democratic institutions. Um, we have to ensure that this is a moment in which we understand the urgency of the problem we're facing, um, the need for action, because it is an, ex is, you know, to, to extend on the question that you asked Mira, yeah, it is an existential crisis. It's an existential crisis for more than just news media. Um, it's so much more at stake. Thank you, Khadija, for this. It's uh, indeed, I want to take away this uh, message of a great moment of opportunity. And I want to come back to that in a second round, um, because uh, when we come closer to the end of the session, I want us to leave with that, with that thought of it being a great moment of opportunity and hearing also how we can, you know, capitalize on this opportunity um, rather than dwell on, on the challenges that we are facing. Um, but before we, we get to, the, to that round, I want to turn to Susie um, and, and maybe follow up particularly on um, what, uh, well, all of you previously have mentioned, uh, maybe Khadija mentioned, you know, the need to recalibrate, um, particularly the relation between media and platforms. Um, Teresa at the beginning mentioned, you know, AI is one of the biggest challenges and threats to media freedom in terms of the, these new and emerging technologies really um, having a, a vast impact on our information space. Mira, you also touched upon these um, issues. So, uh, Susie, I mean, you've, you know, your research strongly intersects with how technology is playing a role in all of this. So can you tell us a little bit about how the development and, and deployment um, of these technologies is shaping the information space, how this is impacting um, our rights, um, but also um, beyond the impact, how can we how can we address it? What you know? How can we ensure that this information landscape can be better, <laughs> um, can be respectful of human rights, and conducive to democracy? Thank you. It's a huge pleasure um, to be here, even if not to be uh, in person in Kyoto. And I think you know what um, Teresa and Mira and Khadija have already said. I would absolutely endorse and sort of see if I can build on it. And I think. This issue of the prolonged crisis and a lack of shared ground, you know, there's simultaneously a lack of shared ground, but also a lack of sort of individual opportunity for analysis and opinion um, and, and sort of breaking out of silos. Um, and I think one of the things that for me really struck me this year, you know, not only in terms of sort of human rights and somebody who writes in um you know, print media, but also someone who is a creative writer, is that the dawning of this sort of mass access to generative AI is now something which, you know, we've seen over the past two decades, a sort of erosion of international media. Now we're seeing a complete hammering of all opportunities for creativity, if you like, whether it's written creators, whether it's, um, whether it's image creators, you know, there's a huge crisis of what it means to be human and to express yourself and communicate with other humans. But what I think there is right now is a real opportunity. I think there's a window. I think we're seeing a massive shift. It's almost as if, you know, technology may well have overreached and may now be starting to eat itself. And so what I would say, you know, certainly for, from a media perspective, but also from a, you know, a creative perspective and the engagement of media organisations with journalists is that I think the way forward, if you want to ensure that you're a respected outlet and a beacon of truth, you have to keep it human. And to keep it human, you have to pay real humans to do the work. What you will find if you suddenly decide that it's much more efficient and effective to get an AI to do your analysis for you or to do your you know, journalism for you is that you will be spouting anodyne rubbish. That's what's going to be on your platform. And people are seeing it and will start to move away from it. And I mean, you see that even in terms of, of search. You know, if you use AI search, you then get a sort of potted digest, which may or may not be true. And I mean, for me, my first sort of foray into experimenting with chat GPT was, you know, obviously to ask it about who am I and chat GPT at that stage said I didn't exist. 
So then I asked it who wrote my book and it came out with 20 different men, some of whom, according to Google, don't exist. But, you know, they were men. So they were probably writing about, you know, deep thoughts about human rights and, uh, and thought. And, and I mean, that's one thing that it's great to be here on a panel with such incredible women um, to prove that women do think about, <laughs> about things deeply and have important things to say. And I think there is a really serious danger for media outlets if they rely too heavily on the hype around generative AI that they will become obsolete, untrustworthy, and people will ultimately turn away. And I think that's what Mira was saying about how people crave stories and seeking out info, but also people aren't stupid. You know, people can see the pollution in the information environment. And I think that the opportunity for media organizations now is to double down on their integrity and double down on their humanity. And I think we are at an inflection point where people will start to recognize the problems with the online information space. And I think the online information space itself uh, will readjust. So I think keeping it human is the way forward for a bit of hope and resilience. It, it's hard right now, but I think we're at a turning point. Thank you, Susie. Keeping it human, I like that. Um... I have to say you have a lot of confidence in society and their <laughs> their trust in, in the future of this. Um, I do. I, I want to follow up on that and actually ask more questions. But before I do, I, I also want to stop for a moment because I know that this is or I want it to be an interactive um, session. So I want to take a moment and also um, make sure that you know everyone who is listening either from uh, Kyoto in, in the room, but also everybody here online. If you have any immediate you know, comments or questions to our fantastic speakers, please do um, raise your hand or um, put it in the chat uh, and uh, we will definitely pick up on that and, and um, make sure that you can uh, pose your question. Ah, we already have Emmanuel um, as we do in the uh, in the chat I don't know Emmanuel do you want to turn on um, or shall we turn on I don't know can we turn on your microphone do you want to ask the question in person I'd much rather see and hear you uh, <laughs> than read out your question if I may you don't have to I don't want to put any pressure if you rather I read it I'm very happy to but I want to give you the opportunity to to speak for yourself so Emmanuel your microphone is off if you want to say some uh, on sorry if you want to say something no okay I will read out the question to our uh, expert speakers. So there's two questions. First, how can we ensure that everyone has equal access to reliable information in the digital town square, especially when platforms are controlled by private companies? That's the first question. And second, what strategies can be implemented to tackle the spread of disinformation and misinformation on the online public interest information space? Who should be responsible for enforcing them? So anybody want to pick up on the first question on equal access? Mira, I see you've already mm -hmm. turned on your microphone. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to just kind of have a go. They're very big questions and there's no simple answer. But equal access to the online space is really important because it's partly about Internet penetration and making sure everyone has connectivity. But then also looking very hard at the role social media companies play in this space and recognizing the role that they play, because there's been a almost a kind of cognitive dissonance over what they do. And the reality is that they make their money in one part of the world, but their user base is in another part of the world. And I think this really distorts access globally. So if you look at Meta, you know, their users are mainly in Asia, but that is, but their money is made in, in, in North America and the regulation happens in Europe and in North America. So there is nobody really looking on a global scale at how do these companies cope with their responsibilities to ensure access to news in other parts of the world. And I think this is a really fundamental problem. So there's kind of two issues, which is ensuring everyone has broadband and digital access. And then in certain parts of the world, a lot of this connectivity is done through mobile 
phone companies, so ensuring that mobile phone companies are supported really in, in spreading this access, and then looking at how the distribution of news happens in these spaces. And it's a, it's there's just inherent contradictions there, and it's not really clear who's taking responsibility. And I see Khadija's nodding there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, agree with everything Mira has said. Um, I am from the part of the world where most people are accessing the internet through mobile. Um, and uh, that might be the only way they do experience um, internet services. Um, so I think that it's essential that we also understand the complexity of access. Um, and what you know, and I think that when we're thinking about inequality and social uh, economic inequality, we're seeing also you know different um, different layers of inequality appearing now. With I think you know the levels of internet penetration and how that is differentiated across contexts being another clear sign of how social economic inequality is manifesting itself. But um, you know, alongside that, I think that what we're also seeing is access to quality information, um, where the best information in some contexts is um, you know, uh, only available uh, for a fee. Um, and uh, you know, and then most people are only be able to access less you know, less good information, information that perhaps isn't as rigorously sourced. Um, and so, again, you know, there's another kind of information inequality happening there. And I think, you know, so I'd like to think about that as another layer on top of that uh, digital um, uh, inequality as well. Um, and, you know, just I think that the fact that the, you know, the platforms have to be more accountable. They simply have to be more accountable. We've never had companies as large and as powerful as the technology platforms in human history, I think. And um, therefore dealing with them is, you know, that there's no precedent for it. But um, it's essential, I think, for governments to hold them account. Um, uh, it's absolutely essential. Um, and therefore, you know, just to if I'm if I could just jump into the next question there about you know who should be responsible for enforcing them, um, the same companies who are responsible uh, for collecting revenue off of those platforms have to employ people to ensure uh, the quality of information on those uh, on those platforms. Um, you know, Meta will tell you that they have. You know, they have some people, but when you look at how many people they have um, compared to the number of users in a particular context um, or, you know, the languages um, in which uh, people, their employees are, are, are uh, proficient in, there's, there's a huge gap there. Um, so for me, what is really a problem is the profit motive of uh, these technology companies. Don't get me wrong. I, I mean, they... they they're free to make profits, but I think the astronomical profits that they're making at the cost of human security um, is something that has to be decried, and it's something that has, to, uh, you know, that has to change. Absolutely. No, thank you. Thank you for both of those, uh, uh, I think, very, very detailed um, and, and helpful replies to the both questions. We have... Um, can I just ah oh, yes, Susie, please. Go yeah, ahead. just to give a quick. I mean, I would absolutely agree with this. I think it's an incredibly complex question, and I mean, one of the big complexities is, of course, that we've now got this idea that we can have free global information sources at all times. But ultimately, going back to my kind of point about keeping it human, you know, somebody has to be providing <laughs> these services. Um, you know, people need to be paid to produce reliable content, to do investigative journalism, to deliver these platforms. And I think that's a really, it, it is a really complicated question. And it's something that, you know, historically, I remember people sort of talking about, oh, well, you know, if you want to, and we're seeing it now, this sort of question of, well, if you want, you know, quality information, then you have to pay for it. And so maybe what you need is a, you know, a, pay, a paying system in these kind of platforms. But of course, that then means that you've got one level of people who can afford to get unpolluted information and another level of people who are effectively being fed, you know, what George Orwell in 1984 called prol feed um, and are then open to exploitation and control. 
it's one of those sort of interesting questions, which I think relates as well to, you know, debates that are happening as well in many countries about, you know, access to public libraries. There's a sort of question of where public information spaces are you know, being defunded because we can all get all this fabulous information off the Internet for free. What happens then when that information is either closed down or it's totally unreliable? So I think there are really big uh, questions and clearly, you know, who's responsible? Well, whether or not you want your state to be responsible for your access to information probably depends very much on who you are and where you are. Uh, in the world. Um, so that's a bit of a you know double edged sword. And I think it is it is a really big question. These are really complex questions that we're not going to be able to answer in five minutes today, but I think are really important to explore. Um, so thank you. Yeah. And it brings back to the point that Khadija made that really there are so many layers to discrimination here and that we need absolutely an intersectional approach in addressing those different layers. Teresa, I think you wanted to pick up on a point that was just made. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I fully endorse everything that has been said. Um, I really just uh, wanted to, uh, you know, reinforce one or two points. The first one is, of course, the problem of the access to the infrastructure. Uh, so it's a more material uh, aspect uh, and the, a more material dimension of the problem. And then, of course, uh, and this involves not only uh, it involves economic uh, uh, issues, uh, availability of the services, so many things. Um, but I also, uh, I also would like to point to something that, in a way, is always there when platforms are controlled by private companies. That's true. It's very true. But we shall not forget that they are occupying the public space. And you cannot occupy a public space without rules. And I think we have to be clear on that. And this is what is missing. Okay, they are private companies, so they can do whatever they want. And it's up to us to make them more or less accountable. I think that we, we need to go further and to have a serious conversation uh, about what it what means for a private company to control the public sphere. The public sphere is our public sphere of all uh, uh, all of us as citizens. Uh, so for me, this is a, a very uh, a very complex question. Again, nothing is easy here, but uh, maybe you have we have to look at. Uh, at this question and through not so uh, in, a, in the usual way, okay, they are private companies and, uh, you know, yes, they are, but uh, we are responsible, all of us, we are responsible for the public space. And again, and uh, Susie, thank you very much, because I... I used to say many times we need to rehumanize the world and not dehumanize the world that way, which is very much what we are doing. So thank you very much for bringing this this question and putting it uh, you re really in the center of our discussion. This is about human beings. This is about empowering human beings. This is about uh, because if we are not empowered. We can never belong to a, to a group, to a society, to a community. We cannot participate in the life of this community. We cannot, uh, in a way, be part of the force that is able to transform positively our communities and not to destroy them. Because democracy, and this is about conflict, but it's also about the possibility of compromising on different and divergent interests and sometimes conflicting interests. This is democracy. And for that, we need information and we need participation. So access is fundamental. And at the same, at the same time, to, we need access, but we need access to something that's produced by human beings, which is information. Sorry. 
maybe no, I was absolutely. too lucky. Absolutely. And I really like that we keep coming back to this point that it is about humans and that uh, this rehumanizing rather than dehumanizing approach. Yes. So thank you for, for highlighting that again. We have two more uh, questions from the audience um, and, um, and, and a comment in the chat. I won't, because it's quite an active chat, I won't read out all the comments. So if anybody wants to particularly um, speak out and, and and share their comment. Do let me know. I am happy to read it for you or give you the floor. But in the meantime, um, let me first turn to our um, next question, which is by the Ghana IGF Remote Hub. If we can turn on your video and or microphone, maybe you can pose the question directly to our speakers. Your microphone is on, so we should be able to hear you. Okay. Good morning. I'm Kweku Dennis from Ghana Pentecost University. My question is, in developing countries where me, the media are limited to speak on issues that favor a certain government, uh, how, do we, how effective is democracy in such countries? And what role is the government and communication authorities playing to ensure the media works independently from the government? Anyone want to respond? Susie? Yeah, please. Yeah, I think that's an incredibly important question. And I think it goes back to the, you know, the importance of human rights more broadly, that it's not just about the internet. And I mean, in, you know, in countries where human rights are not selected, expressing yourself on the internet is a very dangerous activity. Um, in itself. And so I think it really does come down to the importance of working on questions of democratization and human rights holistically and not just looking at it as a, as a sort of bubble question about tech companies. So I think it's a really um, important question and again a very complicated question that doesn't have a quick fix but I think it, there is a tendency and there can be a tendency in international public policy to sort of look at the next shiny thing and forget all of the things that we've been working on uh, for decades and sort of, you know, since the UDHR. And I think it's very important to look at these new questions within the broader context of all the old questions that are not yet fully resolved. Thanks, Susie. And I just want to acknowledge it's fantastic to see so many of you on one screen there in the Ghana IGF Remote Hub. So. Hi, and thanks for, for joining and listening uh, to us and engaging. Um, there's one more question. I've been asked to read it by Dan Gilmore for any, any of you who want to um, address it. Um, his question is, instead of granular content regulation of big companies, would it be better to break them up by enforcing competition laws and give people better choices? If anybody wants to uh, touch on that very briefly, um, then we might just about have enough time for another round of very quick questions to all of you. Mira. I, I can jump in quickly. Um, yes, because I think we've run away. We ha haven't recognized the monopolistic power of these technology companies fast enough. And we also haven't kind of accepted that they are essentially a, a operating as media companies or as publishing houses. So all these other sectors that do have to operate under competition laws are finding themselves at a disadvantage because they're being the market is being distorted by the fact that the com technology companies haven't been classified as operating in their space. Um, giving people better choices, again, where? So if we broke up these large technology companies, would there be new companies that will operate as effectively in Ghana, in Indonesia, and give the citizens their better choices? At the moment, I don't see the mechanisms where that would necessarily happen. So if we do want to say we need to break up these companies, which I think, you know, there's very, very strong arguments for doing that, we need to ensure that there are ways of supporting smaller technology companies in all parts of the world to provide the same digital access and that that they that they do provide as well. Thanks, Mira. And since we've already sort of naturally uh, gone into the direction of talking more and more about uh, social media platforms, big tech, you know, the elephant in the room, as it's always often referred to in these conversations, um, I want to go 
um, very quickly through another round of questions to our speakers that that focuses more on on, on this particular um, uh, group of actors um, and and shifting the order a bit just because of uh, the the natural progression of the conversation um, I want to maybe uh, turn to Susie first this time um, how do we address the elephant in the room um, not just in you know reactionary ways um, because as we see most of the time it's about introducing regulation um, in ways that really responds to harms that have already been caused or uh, mitigate potential harms but how do we address um, this issue in ways that can perhaps even effectively reshape you know their current business model um, the question was just uh, posed about that sort of in a way and Mira's touched upon it um, how can we reshape, you know, the business model in ways that first and foremost serves the public interest, serves, you know, um, um, media's role in, in democracies? Well, I'm, I'm quite optimistic that I think things are starting to change. Having said that, and I think echoing what Mira's just said, I think the problems are very different in different parts of the world. And I'm not sure that there's a one size fits all solution. But I think we are in a stage where, if you like, I mean, I've been of the view for a long time that the problem is not really an absence of regulation. It's an absence of enforcement of existing laws and regulations. And we're now starting to see things shift. So I think, you know, the European Data Protection Board talking about Meta's business model being not compliant with the GDPR. You know, in Norway as well, uh, Meta's business model being declared unlawful and them effectively uh, being shut down, seeing in Canada, um, you know, Meta saying, right, well, we're not serving news on our platform because of the change in um, Canadian uh, law around, you know, payment for, for news. I think this is very much an opportunity for change. And I think we will see different business models coming out of that, because I think the current business model is starting to shake and be on its last legs. So I think the question is, what comes next? I think one of the problems that we've seen with traditional media, I mean, certainly, you know, in Europe and North America, one of the problems um, and frustrations that I find is you've kind of got an all or nothing approach from, you know, online news outlets where either it's sort of completely free access or you've got a situation where you've got to sign up for an annual um, subscription in order to access things. And I think that online news outlets are going to start having to think more subtly about how they engage with the public. Looking at it as well, more from the perspective of choice rather than personalization, because personalization has not been about choice. This sort of micro personalization that media companies have sort of jumped on because they're seeing this is what social media is doing. So I'm seeing completely different news to what you're seeing because of an analysis of who I am and what I might be interested in. Actually working out models, maybe with micro payments where I can choose what I want to look at and not have to sort of, you know, buy the whole cow, choose where I can get my milk from, if you like. And I think we are in a, a at an inflection point where there are opportunities for creative thinking about uh, business models and as I say you know that's with the caveat that that means very different things potentially in, in different parts of the world but I think there is an opportunity for change now. Thanks Susie so maybe just building on the notion of opportunities um, for different business models for for, for um, different uh, models of uh, um, information and and um, uh, I, I really want to focus on the sort of positive, how we can build uh, a better information space. And, and with that, I, can, I want to turn to Mira next. Um, uh, keeping the opportunities in mind, how can we, you know, think about the, the, the use of emerging technologies like AI, um, generative AI, um, in ways that because they are in a way redefining journalism, information and communication already. But how can we see it as an opportunity? How can they, uh, how can journalism benefit from this rather than the harms that we have already heard about? 
Well, I think going back to Susie's point about keeping things human, there's been an obsession about using technology for scale. If we're online and we normally reach 100 people, can we reach 1,000? Can we make it a million? And I think we really need to look and, and there's been a thinking that that's the point of technology, that the reason you go online is to reach millions of people at once and do these massive blanket things online and forgetting that you can't if you can't do them in the real world at that scale, you probably can't do them online at that scale. And so commu digital communities can also be small, focused uh, and done on a human scale. So I think we really need to start using technology more on that scale. And when you start looking at that, AI has huge potential because you can use AI to understand your communities better. You can use that to provide information for them in their local languages, in local dialects. What we're seeing at Internews, because we work with journalists around the world, is that resource poor newsrooms are using it to improve the click rate of their newsletters to kind of to take something that the IPCC has put out on climate change, for example, and distill it down to something that their local readership can understand and use in, in local languages and can pull out graphics. So that's the beneficial use of AI is to uh, forget the idea of scale and kind of bring it back to a local size. The flip side is that emerging technologies can spread huge amounts of misinformation and create these huge polarizing narratives. And that is where we need the regulation that Teresa spoke about, the kind of recognitions that they operate on a public on a, in the public space. And it and it's not up to local journalists to try and solve the problem of that kind of disinformation being spread across borders at vast scale. That is something that really needs to be done by regulators and policymakers. Thanks, Mira. Yes, I, I think we can all agree that the time of assuming so-called self-regulation of big tech is over and it's time to see some hard um, regulation and direction in, in improving their practices. Um, so, so thanks for, for that point. I want to take a bit of a turn now because I don't want this question to go unanswered. It's a difficult one and I apologize to Khadija in advance that I'm directing it towards you. But um, I, I want us to reflect on this before we, uh, you know, um, move on. Um, we've spoken a lot about, you know, the, the changes, I mean, the crisis, but also opportunities, overall the shift, the big change we're seeing in, in the information landscape, the big changes we're seeing for media. Um, and it's also a question that uh, we at the office, uh, together with Teresa and, and her team, have been grappling with a lot as well. So it's something that I want to pose here. But when we're talking about the media, independent media, freedom of media, what or who is our current understanding or perhaps your current understanding of the media when we talk about, you know, freedom of the media as a concept? Yeah, it, it, uh, I guess we could have a whole conference actually on just this subject. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if there are conferences already convened to, to address this subject. Um, you know, the, the concept of media that I grew up with, you know, it was, uh, you know, the television news that, uh, you know, I sat um, in the in the family room watching every evening uh, with my parents or the newspaper that I waited for the delivery um, uh, every day. Um, and in most instances, a young person today has not experienced that version of news media um, at all. And it's not likely to experience that. So even our idea of what is news media has shifted um, in terms of, you know, the actual products that news media produces has expanded greatly because newspapers, they exist to some extent. The television news, uh, you know, through linear broadcasting still exists. But increasingly, we're seeing news products being delivered in alternate um, means. You know, we have platform-based um, news products, for example, that are uh, an exciting um, development, I think. Um, but uh, increasingly, I think what we have to understand is what defines, what are the defining characteristics of the news media that we are fighting for its freedom, for which we are fighting its, its freedom. And it's media that is 
first of all, accountable in itself. It's a news media that is accountable in itself, that is subject to some kind of code um, that, you know, publishes, uh, you know, this code somewhere or is, you know, or makes clear that there is a code um, that it is, uh, that it is subject to, that all of its work will conform to these norms. And, you know, some of these norms are very simple things like, um, you know, when we, when we accuse person X of doing, of doing something, we will give person X an opportunity also to respond to this. Um, so ensuring that news media are the kind of media, quality news media are ensuring that these codes um, are, you know, are not just, you know, implemented, that they're also invigorated through new practices to make sure that, um, you know, even through the new products um, that we develop, that, you know, I think that this is really, really important because the nature of news is fast um, and inevitable mistakes do happen. Um, if we just think about uh, you know, uh, developments in geopolitics of the last few days. I've seen so many broadcasts, for example, where, um, you know, uh, a statement is made by a reporter that has to be, um, you know, kind of climbed back um, after a few minutes because, you know, new information has come out. That is the nature of news. It's very quick, especially in, um, you know, in a situation where there's a conflict, for example. Um, but the identifying characteristic of uh, news media is that it is able to do that and it does so transparently that and I think transparency is another key defining characteristic of course there are some contexts where um where transparency for news media is dangerous um in that um if they are if they are to uh, divulge who exactly they're funded by in you know in very close societies you know this might mean that that owner of that operation might become um you know subject to some kind of judicial process but in most democratic uh settings we think that you know a key characteristic of news media, of the kind of media that we're fighting for freedom for is transparency in both its processes, but also in itself, in who it is, in who uh, funds it. Because ultimately what we want is news that is free from the undue influence, whether that is commercial influence or political influence. Um, that is, you know, the ideal that we're working for. Um, and that varies from context to context. So, yeah, it's it's such a meaty question. And I feel like, you know, I, I could talk a lot more about it. But I think that we have to think about the fact that, first of all, the, you know, and also differentiate between the different products, media and news media products that exist today. Um, and that has shifted. But I think that what remains is uh, the the, the philosophy of journalism that has to be um, embraced throughout these products. And that is a philosophy of transparency, of accountability, and ultimately of quality. Thank you so much, Khadija. I know it's a, it's a big and difficult question, but I think the exercise is almost a, just, you know, a food for thought with what you have already um, um, mentioned and you framed it really uh, perfectly with news media um, and, and its, its role in serving the public interest, its need for being transparent, at least in ways that doesn't threaten their livelihood. Um, all these things can strengthen, you know, the reliability and legitimacy of, of, um, of independent media. And of course, being free from undue influence. Very, very important um, points and, and many other that you mentioned, I will not repeat. Um, but I want to turn and quite intentionally to Teresa um, after these presentations, because uh, I know that um, uh, this is uh, a topic overarchingly that uh, we are grappling with a lot in the office, you are grappling a lot with as the representative. Um, so I wanted to wait uh, and, and pose you a, a rather reflective question on, on these um, on, on the discussion we've had so far and ask you about your thoughts on, on, on all of this, on the changing um, media environment. And also what is, what is the role um, you know, of, of the OSCE representative on freedom of the media in, in addressing all of these issues? Um, maybe if you could tell us a little bit about, uh, about that. 
Oh, wait, we have to turn on your Sorry. Uh, thank you. And, um, and also thank you very much uh, for giving me, giving me this, uh, this possibility to explain a little bit what is the role and how is, uh, how is the office working uh, in, in all these important issues that are uh, clearly uh, uh, defining issues for the future uh, of the media uh, as such. Um, but first of all, and I would like just a, a, a little bit of uh, publicity. Uh, you know, this year, uh, Khadija, after everything that Khadija said, I just wanted to point it out that uh, in the joint declaration of the free speech mandate holders, uh, which means the OSC of the global system, the OSC, the African Union, um, the, the, the UN, as well as the, the organization of the African states. Uh, I think that there were, which was this year about media freedom and democracy, precisely because we wanted to put together what is relevant for media to really play its role in the democratic system. Um, and uh, I think that uh, two important uh, definitions that appear there and were coined by this, uh, uh, by this joint declaration were, were precisely one of them, what is, uh, uh, what is uh, uh, information on public interests and the other one, what is uh, media freedom. And media freedom is precisely what you, Khadija, said. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, that's the reason why I just wanted. Uh, we didn't. We did not invent. We tried to coin in a in a, a, a document with a global impact in principle. Um, what what does it mean, media freedom, and what does it mean, public interests? And speaking about public interests, what is the content? that really uh, supports democratic debate. So, and this is related to media, this is related to, uh, to democracy. And of course, um, uh, you know, it's uh, the mandate of the RFOM is, is quite uh, a, an interesting one because uh, it's a mandate uh, of an institution uh, which is, placed in an organization, the OSC, which is a security organization. So, uh, and this is very important again, and back to uh, media is essential for democracy and for security. And I think this, we need to insist on that. It's not just uh, a standalone issue, it's not just a kind of an ornament or something of our democracies, but it's key uh, for our, uh, our common security. And this is very interesting because in the founding documents of the USC, the access to information, the free flow of information are looked at as key pillars to achieve peace and security. Uh, which is quite interesting, and it's not what happened in other uh, organizations or in other institutions that uh, could have uh, in the in the global system similar mandates. But our agenda is an agenda for peace and for security, and I think it's uh, it's uh, very important to stress this message, especially nowadays we where we are witnessing terrible wars raging uh, across uh, the world, uh, unfortunately, uh, with, the, with uh, uh, horrible consequences uh, for humankind. Uh, so this is, uh, and this is uh, the framework in which we want to work. And, uh, and we try to develop uh, our, uh, our work. And, uh, and again, for, having this uh, uh, media freedom uh, as a reality in our societies uh, and bearing in mind all the digital uh, disruptions introduced uh, by the digital evolution, 
and, mm. and the business model and everything that uh, uh, and all the issues that were raised by all of you, um, we are very much focused on exploring uh, the concept of public interest framework and you know uh, and how can we really um, develop the concept and implement the concept uh, and have a real again uh, a real uh, information space that is clean and really contributes to our democratic debate. Thank um, you. That's that's what I wanted to say. And uh, thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa, for these uh, final words. And with that, um, I want to conclude our session. Um, uh, first, also, um, thank you to um, my colleague, Julia, who has really um, put together a wonderful summary of our main um, messages. Thanks a lot, Julia. In closing, I also want to thank all of you, um, the speakers, but also the participants for engaging in this session. And I want to say, uh, you know, as we stand at this, you know, crossroads of this new era of, um, for, for the media, the questions, as you have heard, are, are really overwhelming. So this is a topic that certainly needs much more than a one hour session. It needs constant reflection. And I, and I would invite all of you, all of us, uh, to continue doing so. Um, with the RFOM office in our work towards a public interest framework and, and, and a healthier online information system, but also in your own daily work and, and your daily lives. So thank you so much um, for joining us today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of IGF 2023 um, and wishing you all a lovely rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you all of you. Bye-bye. Sorry, Yulia, do we need to save anything or can I just leave the meeting? <laughs>